you. I'm going to see if Phil is online. Phil, can you hear me? Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Phil, how are you? I'm not, I'm not too bad, not too bad. Good. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your uh, time and hopefully answering some uh, good questions and hopefully we'll have we'll enjoy it and go along the way as well. It'll be great to hear some of your stories as well. So thank you very much again. No, that's no problem. Um, I have to thank Dawn Scott again for the introduction to yourself as well. I'm sure you've had some uh, fun moments working with Dawn recently as well, which I'm sure she'll bring up when uh, you guys, <laughs> guys talk later on. Yeah, I think I'm going to get some of them out in the next hour, I think. <laughs> well, likewise, don't, feel as though you don't have to hold back against Dawn. If you've got anything towards Dawn, bring that later on as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I will do, I will do. <laughs> um, so, look, and again, I think I think really hopefully this, this Q&A will go towards just trying to bring across your experiences from transitioning from a player to a coach and also the difference what you've experienced with the men's to the women's side of the game as well so yeah um really the first one because normally i ask everyone about the background and how they got to where they went through which i'm happy for you to go i'm conscious we've only got an hour and you've got a very good uh, good story and background to yourself so really just looking at question number one bill you can just talk to us about your transition from player to a coach and what inspiration inspirations and lessons did you take along the way with you well i think uh i i was quite fortunate i got the coaching bug uh <clears throat> really early and i think i think when i was fortunate enough to play at the top level international football and uh, at club level uh, where we competed for a lot of trophies and i think it was always difficult to to try and fit in the coaching side but i think i think i'd made a conscious effort when i got to about the age of 24 looking at the the process that you have to go through you know for the two years to get your b license two years to get your a license then another two years to get your uh, pro license which would enable you to become a manager in in any in any sport, I'm sorry, in any football club in the world, I realised that that was a six-year process and I had to start it early because at the time I was playing international football, so I knew that probably every other summer I was going to go to a major tournament, which was when the courses were going to be. So I started at 24 and I got my pro licence when I was 35, which was the year before I finished my career. So I realised early on I had to start early. And from the age of 24, I got the bug. I got the bug of recording every single training session that uh, I took part in at Manchester United, at England and at Everton. Uh, and, and in particular, I think the sessions that I think had the biggest effects on me or, or not necessarily the sessions, but the way that they were delivered or, or the way that they were uh, sort of like communicated, sort of like difficult moments in and out of the dressing room when, when managers uh, handled certain situations with certain players, if they were having problems, if they were, they, I used to go to press conferences towards the end of my career to sit at the back of the room to see how Sir Alex Ferguson or David Moyes or my England managers would act because I thought to myself that this is, this is like your, probably like your playing career. I, I had to put the same amount of effort, dedication, sacrifice into uh, becoming a coach. And, and I wanted to be, uh, and I still do, I want to be the best coach that I can possibly be. So the, the minute that I finished my uh, playing career at 36, and I wanted to play for as long as I possibly could, literally literally the day after, I went, I went into, uh, I went into a, a job with the un England under 21s. I went to a European Championships just just with Stuart Pearce, just as a, a young coach wanting to learn. And I came back from there and I got the job at Manchester United to be the first team coach with David Moyes. And and people say it was a big jump and I was in at the deep end. But for me, it was more about the fact that I'd, I'd done I'd done a lot of the uh, preparation. I'd, I'd got my coaching license. I'd, I'd done a lot of sessions. I'd been, I'd come back for the last four or five years of my career and worked in the academy. I'd worked in the academy. I'd worked in first team football. I'd worked in youth football. I'd worked with uh, disabled kids. So I, I felt as felt as if I'd covered a lot of ground in terms of my doing the, the, the doing the donkey work beforehand. And uh, but I've got to say that nothing nothing at all prepares you for that moment when when a set of players comes over to you and it was my first day and it re I realised I realised on my first day at Manchester United that that it's not something that you could just go out there as a player you think coaches just go out there and they wing it and, and they just put a session on well 
Well, when you've got Rooney, Ferdinand, Vidic, Giggs, Evra, uh, Van Persie walking over to you and you've just been told you've got 30 to 35 minutes to, to almost prepare a technical session uh, and deliver a technical session to world-class players, you realise very early on that, that the preparation actually is the biggest thing that actually goes into it. And, and, and what you do, you probably go back into your memory bank and, and think about the coaches that inspired you and why they inspired you. And those are the things that I used to jot down about coaches that, who were the coaches that got the best out of me? Why was that? What did they do? What special qualities did they have? And almost even the ones that didn't do probably learn off them as well. And I, and I look back at my coaches and, and Sir Alex is the biggest one really that, that springs to mind and David Moyes, because I spent 18 years with both of them is that, when I went to Everton, the question I always got asked was, what was Sir Alex Ferguson like as a coach? And, and people were expecting uh, the pearls of wisdom, the magic boat, the key to, to the kingdom. And, and I suppose people will probably ask the same about Pep Guardiola now, who I've studied, is that simplicity was the best thing that he ever did. He kept things very, very simple uh, in everything, in terms of his coaching. Uh, and bearing in mind that Sir Alex Ferguson never coached a, a, a session that I actually, in 12 years in the first team at Manchester United, never coached a session. It was his, it was his assistants that always did the coaching. But the way, the way he spoke to his players, the way he connected with his players, the way that he trusted his players, the way he set the discipline within the dressing room, the way he led the values, and, and we'll probably talk about values later on when we talk about the Lionesses. I think values are a wonderful thing to have in your sports organisation and as a coach because you've got to live with those values. And uh, the biggest thing that Sir Alex Ferguson had, he had a strong culture and he had strong values that every single staff member and every single player had to live by. And David Moyes had the same at Everton. And when you look at sporting organisations that are successful, and that is in football or, or in any sport, I think what, what people probably tend to talk about are the values and the culture. And that, that was the biggest thing that I probably learned from a management point of view is that get the culture and the values right within your team. And then if you get the coaching sessions right, and I, I go back to the coaches that I've had that have inspired me, there was Brian Kidd, there was Steve McLaren, there was Steve Round at Everton, Alan Irvine, uh, Sammy Lee was, was a fantastic coach, and then coaches that I worked with in Spain. The biggest thing that they give me was, was the biggest thing was the challenge. The challenge of when I walked out onto a training field, one, the session was always ready and prepared. Two, their energy, the energy in which they gave me meant, meant that I didn't have an excuse then to give the same energy back. And then, and then I suppose the biggest thing was the challenge, the challenge of putting on a session that would take me out my comfort zone, that would give me the biggest challenge and would be, give me the biggest scope to improve, develop and learn. And I think, I think that those were the main qualities that I, I learned, which meant that when I became a coach, uh, the values that I learned from the managers that I played for, the environments that I'd experienced, both good and bad, meant that I, I'd built up a little bit of my own philosophy along the way. That's that's great, and cheers to that. Like when, so when you were actually a player, do you think you obviously you had a different mindset probably to what some of your teammates had because yeah. they were playing and they were turning up, and sometimes those rules and kind of the um, structure that coaches put in place are kind of seen as negative. Did, yeah. Do you think you learned early in your playing career that that was what you wanted to do? So because of that, you actually took them on board a lot more than your teammates as well? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because I, I knew that my, my career was only going to last uh, probably for 35 years of my life. So I needed something to, I needed something for the next 30 years to challenge me. And, and I think what I loved about football was the structure. And I, I loved the detail in which went into planning and preparing and delivering. Uh, and, and I think what I loved the most was I, I loved the environments and the culture that, in particular, I was inspired. I, I've got to say, Sir Alex Ferguson was a genius in which he inspired a whole club. And, and, and I'll give an example of, of, of how you create a culture is that when he left and I went into Manchester United with, with David Moyes, who, who was a brilliant, brilliant manager, uh, you didn't realise until Sir Alex left the culture which he, which he developed. And there was one day, I think it was the second or third day, we, we went into the canteen. It was about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. 
uh, obviously coaches uh, and and the place was was an absolute it was empty the, the place was uh was dead and 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 david david moyes the boss said to me said look where's everyone gone and i just said to him well come in the morning at six o'clock uh, and I'll meet you in the gym. So the next morning, even though David Moyes didn't come that early, you go in the gym at six o'clock and every staff member was in the gym at six o'clock because that was the culture that Sir Alex Ferguson developed. Every He used to come in early. He used to come in early every single day. He wanted to get in before the traffic. So he'd get in, he'd do his gym work. The rest of the club would do the same. And then by three o'clock, I think I think what Sir Alex uh, wanted to develop at Manchester United was the fact that he was a, he was a family man. Is is obviously... The day lasted from seven o'clock till three o'clock rather than from nine till till four or five. So he, he liked to get in before the traffic and get home before the traffic because obviously he had things to do at night with, with the club of size of Manchester United. So every morning at six, seven o'clock, the whole gymnasium was full of, of the staff from Manchester United almost attacking the day almost setting getting your getting your shopping place before the players came in and then when the players came in at 8 30 9 o'clock everybody had done the workout everybody had had breakfast together and then they were ready to attack the day and and, and prepare what was world-class sessions and inspiration for the players and and i think when he left you didn't realize the effect that those same staff that was still there was still coming at six six thirty, was still having breakfast together, and that culture is is what he developed. He developed a culture of every single staff member being together in everything that he did, and it was quite a powerful it was quite a powerful uh, tool that he used uh, in terms of the success of the club. Seeing the size of some of the biceps. So some of the former Man United staff during your time probably explains that now. If they were yeah. in the gym at that early stage. <laughs> not me though, not, not so me. Like, I, I never did the bicep stuff. <laughs> no, like uh, I've got a few colleagues who probably to hear that though I'll be giving a bit of grief later on. But um, like, do you think that was one of the biggest challenges then? Like when you came in as a coach with David Moyes, was that one of the biggest challenges to maintain that? Or was it easy to try and maintain that culture that had been created there? I think the biggest, it was definitely the biggest challenge. And, and I'd say still to, you think about the managers, David Moyes, Louis van Gaal, uh, Jose Marino, you think about the challenges that they've had of, of, of turning around or changing a culture that had been there for 26 years, 26 years of, of, and what happened was, is that if you was there 26 years ago, the, the young YTS or, or the, the third, fourth, probably in command on the fitness side or in the offices, 10, 15 years later, those people were their head of head of their departments because what he did is he he kept the same staff and allowed them to grow from within the club and he 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 did that so well and 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 those staff then went the whole 26 years with him. He had unbelievable loyalty within a real uh, close knit set of staff working at the training ground and then obviously when. When you've listened to a message and, and, a, and a way of working for 26 years, it's very, very difficult to change that. Arsenal are going through the same thing. Arsene Wenger had a way of working and he took people on a journey and it's so difficult to, to change the vacuum of those messages. And that's why when other managers have come in and, and when David Moyes came in, he, he, he set out that he wasn't going to change things too quickly. He was going to, he was going to take the brilliant bits of what Sir Alex had done and then add his own little stamp on it. But there was, there was definitely resistance to the change on the little things that, that he wanted to implement. And, and the way probably the best way for him to probably would have been to implement those things was you either change the staff or you change the players. And I think, I think it would have took probably two or three years to change both to get a, probably a new way of working. And, and it was a tremendous challenge, almost impossible job. And when people talk about them first 10 months that David Moyes had, I think he did have an impossible job because ultimately the, 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 the answer was always under Sir Alex, we did this under Sir Alex, we did that under Sir Alex, we were successful doing this. So ultimately it was always going to be a, a, a bit of a difficult uh, challenge. And did you find obviously going from a player to what was then an assistant coach, how how did you find that? Obviously, the head coach is the one that has the final say, as you well know now. But yeah, how did you find it going in as an assistant coach first and foremost? I found I found it okay. I was I just finished in football. Uh, I I turned down the job uh, of managing Brighton at uh, three years ago. Gus Poyer had just left. I turned down because I wanted to get some experience under my belt. 
Uh, assistance was great. I, I could learn under the radar a little bit. I was working with world-class players. My job, Manchester United had 26 first-team international players, and obviously the manager takes the bulk of those for the, you know, say the starting 11. And my job was to work with eight to 10 to 11 players that probably weren't in the squad. And, and th these, were, these were seasoned internationals. And at the time, because they weren't playing, because the team weren't doing well, it, it, there were some difficult moments that I learned. I learned some real, real great lessons of, of how to gain the respect of, of, of players, to keep the respect of players and, and to earn and sort of like to earn the, the, the development as, as you as a coach. So uh, I think it was perfect in the first year. The second year when I went to Valencia to work in, in Spain, again, I was assistant manager. Uh, I became a little bit more frustrated in the role because ultimately the decision wasn't mine. And that's when I developed uh, sort of like my philosophy that I needed to be a number one. I, I, one of them, I had five, five managers, four managers in my year in Spain. And when the first one got uh, sacked, who's now the Wolves manager, Nuno Santos Brito, who's a fantastic manager, I, I got the team for two games. And, and literally, we, we, we won the first game. And then the second game was against Barcelona. And it was the great Barcelona side of... Neymar, Suarez and Messi up front. And we, we had 14 players injured and we just had 11 fit players. The, the, pre, the president and the, and the CEO, as they call it over there, came up to me in the pre-match meal and, and literally just said, whatever happens, I'm sorry, you just got to dig in there. We'll take it's Basically, what, what they were saying is they take a 3-4-0 defeat and move on because obviously the next manager was coming in. Uh, and we drew the game 1-1 and it was, it, was the, it was the turning point in my thought process that I needed to be a number one. I needed to be the one that picked the team, did the training sessions, dealt with the players. Uh, and, and then the next six months were really difficult because I was back to being an assistant. So that was the turning point in terms of my, my thought process was that I had to cut myself as a number one. And, and that's why I, I left Spain at the end of the year and, and was looking for a number one job. And did you find those kind of experiences, like working in a different country, really helped shape and influence your coaching philosophy? Or was it predominantly your, your playing days and your British days of playing under Sir Alex, playing with the, under David Moyes? Was that the main influence? Or did you take some stuff from when you were away in Spain as well? Well, I'd, I'd say the year in Spain uh, was probably the best year I had for learning. I, I learned a language. Uh, I learned a language. I, I can now speak Spanish. Uh, I learned probably the detail of what actual proper coaching and the detail of coaching in Spain, they call it meat on the bone. We need more meat on the bone. And, and that was in terms of how to plan a training session. And, and you're talking about minute detail, uh, you know, body shape, angles to pass, uh, the, the, the way that you angle a certain goal, the way that you position the cones, the way that you uh, set up a session. I think the detail in which I learned in that year in Spain was 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 incredible. And, and I came back from Spain with almost a, a different mentality to coaching in terms of the actual depth that you have to go into. Uh, they, they, in Spain, they spend a lot of time uh, coaching, developing, learning, uh, challenging players. And, and it's, it's, it's less on the opposition. It's less on preparing how to sort of like stop an opposition. It's how do we implement our philosophy onto... Uh, into a game plan and, and the in intricacies of the detail of coaching, what I learned in the 12 months in Spain, I think was probably uh, well, probably one of the best learning experiences that I've ever had. And for the first six months, I, I did not understand a word they were saying because I was trying to learn a language. I was trying to coach at the same time. Uh, but along the way, learned and had the most fantastic experience and ended up staying out there for another 12 to 14 months literally just going watching Spanish coaches work uh, trying to perfect the language and the detail uh, and, and and that helped me uh, that I think will help me in my career and so did you find like because I'm guessing your family would have been at, out with you all the time were they all right with the transition as well while you were because obviously it's a full-on experience trying to learn to develop this coaching philosophy as a head coach with a family okay with you being out there yeah, as well? well i mean the i i, I didn't uh, we, we just made the decision we sold everything in england we didn't want anything we didn't want anything to come back to we wanted to actually commit ourselves to the the three years that we committed the, the, the first 
the first six months of moving to any country, I think is the most difficult. Uh, but, but straight away, I think within six months, my wife and children were fluent in Spanish, uh, which made a hell of a difference. Valencia is, is, a, is a city where, where there are not, not many direct flights from Manchester, London or, or Birmingham. So you don't go walking down the streets like you would in Marbella or with people wearing football shirts. If you don't speak Spanish, you don't survive. So we, we threw ourselves into it. My son joined Valencia Academy, so he was really in at the deep end. My, my, my daughter uh, just threw herself into everything. And then within six months, we could never see ourselves coming back. And that's why we stayed out for another 18 months. Uh, to to perfect the language because we love the culture, we love the lifestyle, and still to this day, I think, I think it's a destination where I, I want to return to because the culture and the way that they live their lives in terms of, uh, you know, the, the the hours in the day, the the way that they are relaxed about things, uh, w w suited suited a great lifestyle for us, and the family speak every day about that experience. That's great to hear, and those kind of like life experiences can't really buy and I suppose that's things behind the scenes that you don't really get to see no. when someone like yourself's fronting up to a camera trying to do an in interview in Spanish or English depending on which media you get so I think the biggest challenge uh, Steve is that I was having two hour lessons every day in Spanish but I had to have before training at 7 30 I, I had to have 30 to 45 minutes with my Spanish teacher actually preparing my Spanish for the session that I was going to go into so it was it was brutal that you know the, the the time scale. But ultimately, if you can if you can speak English, you can speak Spanish. You can work in any country in the world, basically. And that's what we that's what we said. We get ourselves out of our comfort zone. I didn't want to I didn't want to go down the path that most coaches go down. Stay in your country. I wanted to travel. I wanted an adventure. I wanted a challenge. And La Liga is one of the best best uh, leagues in the world. And you know I've. I've coached a team that have drawn with Barcelona and I've coached a team that lost 7-1 to Barcelona in the new Camp with, the, with your brother as the manager. If people say they were the disastrous situations, but for me, and I'm sure my brother will say the same, they were the most wonderful, they were the most wonderful learning experiences that, that we could ever have. And uh, it, it stood me in good stead for the next job that I was going to go into. I was going to mention when you said you got frustrated with the head coach. I wasn't going to mention that you worked with your brother at some point, just in case those two kind of came together. Um, no, they didn't because he, because he couldn't speak Spanish. He gave me a lot of responsibility. I, I took a lot of the coaching. So uh, actually the, the three months, the three months I think it was I had with Gary was fantastic because we'd spent so much time together. We, we are the best of friends. It, it, it was probably the moments either side of Gary with, with other coaches that I found probably the most frustrating because if you have a new coach and they are Portuguese or they are Spanish, you, they bring their people in with them, which is perfectly normal, which is football. And, and, and in a way, I was a little bit on the outside of, of, their, uh, of, their, little, of their little community. I think it's interesting you say that. There's a lot of people, probably in the audience as well, that's experienced that within the different, not just in football, but different sports have worked with, like, how... How did you start to try and integrate into that bubble? Is it just a case of working with them and eventually earning a trust? Or do you think it's sometimes with some coaches, it's impossible to get into that kind of circle? Especially yeah, I, for not just as a coach, but also as like support staff as well. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's probably equal to fitness coaches, medical, physios, uh, team liaison officers. I think. I think when you have a group that comes in together, and you see a lot of the coaches now, they they travel within their within their uh, the manager, the assistants, and their own little team. I think that. I think the advice that what I would say is is that you've got to be patient. Uh, you've got to understand probably their side of it, where they are a tight knit team uh, that they've probably been together for a number of years, and and that they trust each other. And you've got to earn that trust, and you earn that trust by. I think by the quality of your work and not by constantly knocking on the door, constantly sort of like putting yourself in their face. What I did, I, I tried to just remain pretty balanced, accept that sometimes, sometimes I would have been included other times not, but hopefully when they saw me work and they saw me interact with the players and they saw the qualities that I had, that then they would respect that and bring, bring me into their family because I, I'm sure that everybody's experienced that kind of work. But I think patience and the fact that it's not personal, it's just probably routine that they have. 
uh, that, that makes them like that, where you feel a little bit on the outside? Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think having experienced well, like with some Portuguese and Russian coaches over the years as well, like, I think you're spot on with what you're saying there. And I suppose the next question that I'm going to come to now really is how going from the men's football side of it and working with different cultures and environments within the men's side, how did you actually find transitioning across to the women's side of the game? Was it similar or did it vary a lot? Uh, I, th- I think if you'd have asked me probably 12 months ago, uh, I would have had a different answer than what I had now. When I, when I took the job, uh, I took the job because of the same reason I took the Valencia job. I wanted to do something different. I could see, I could see the the influence and the opportunities that that females in general were go, were having and that were going to have in the world. And that's not just sport. That was probably in every line of business. I, I, you could sense a change. You could sense a, re, a change of respect towards towards females in general in terms of the opportunities that were get, get, getting provided. So I thought, I, I saw, I had a foresight to say, would well, you know what, this is an unbelievable opportunity to, to, go, into, to go into an organisation where the team, first and foremost, the team was fantastic. Finished third in the world at the last World Cup. Finished. Uh, got to a semi-final of the Euros. I suppose that was the one I was going in and I had a good team. But I also saw the opportunity to to actually be a part of something quite revolutionary, quite inspiring. Uh, and and from the day from the first day that I met the team, I drove down to from Valencia to La Manga. That they were doing a training camp in January in La Manga. I went. And, and, and straight away, you go in with the... Before I went in, I was driving down thinking, I'm just going to do the same sessions. I'm going to speak to them like I would uh, a Man United, a Valencia player, and everything would be, <clears throat> you know, the same. And then, and then when I stood in front of them for the first time and I presented my philosophy, my aims, my objectives, I realised straight away that it was going to be very difficult. It's very different, not difficult. It was going to be very different. The way that they engaged, the way that they communicated, I thought was, was incredible. It inspired me. And then, then when I saw them train, I thought, hellfire, this is going to be unbelievable, this journey, because they hung on your every word. They listened to everything that you said. They were receptive to every kind of detail. They challenged me as a coach more than any other player play a set of players has ever challenged me and then within probably two to three months I remember sitting down with my sister who was the England netball coach and we spoke about we spoke about the leadership committees within the team we spoke about how we empower how we communicate and and from from that moment onwards I realized that I think women's sport or or, or dealing with a women's elite athletes, I think you do need to be bespoke. I think there are, there are massive similarities in terms of the way I coach men and the way I coach women, massive similarities. But I think there are certain areas of coaching in football and coaching women that have to be bespoke for, for female athletes. And that's something that I learned very quickly. Uh, and, And I think that's something that still, I think at the FA, I think we're still developing. We still need to get better at that. There are that there are physical, there are psychological, and there are still technical elements that have to be bespoke for the women's game. And I think, I think we're not at the level yet where it's just one shop fits all. I don't think we'll ever be at that level. And that's not being that's not good or bad. I think it, it, it's just that men aren't women, women aren't men. I think we're built. I think they're built differently. The genetics are different, and and I think the bespokeness now in which we're trying to uh, get the England women's national team, I think, could take us to a whole new level. And I think I think it's really important. And and I learned that very quickly, in, and that was just from me learning the way that I spoke to the players, the way they spoke to me, the way they wanted to be engaged. Uh, the connection was different, and uh, and for me, it was inspiring. I think. Again, it's really refreshing to hear that because like working between two different genders in the same sport, like you said, dealing with them, like the women are so, and that's not saying men aren't receptive, but the women were so receptive to all this new information and hanging on every single word. And I was watching watching the, the talk that you did with Tracy and Gary the other day as well uh, with Jeff Shreves. And did you... You tend to speak to your sister quite a lot about the challenges. You mentioned her earlier, but did you speak to her about the challenges that you would like experience as a male well, working in that female environment? 
I've got to say, and, and, and I don't want to go too deep here, but I learned at first hand, first and foremost, the, the, the obstacles uh, that was put in her way as a, as a female netball player. She played over 100 times uh, for England at netball. And, and we witnessed first hand in our house the, 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 the challenges, the obstacles, the, the, the abuse, <laughs> the, the challenges, everything that was thrown in her way. And, and we was lucky that my, my, my parents and, and were, were both very, very sporty. And, and they, they sort of like, charged the wall down through every barrier that came in her way in terms of sort of like supporting her financially, driving her down to London for training sessions, uh, giving her the freedom to go out to Australia to develop as a netball player and as a coach. Uh, and, and then, and then obviously she became England netball manager. And the first thing, the first person, she was actually, I was sat next to her at a Christmas meal when I got offered the job and she just said, you have to go for it. And I suppose the, 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 the biggest advice that she ever gave to me was that in the first six months that I was in the job, my, my philosophy was a little bit of, I'm going to say you're going to do. And, and then after about six months, she, she, we sat down at a Christmas meal and she virtually said, and we, we were talking through it and she said, you have to, you have to make these players part of your decision making. You have to make them believe that they are part of the decision making. And I said, why? because they'll give you absolutely even more. And, and it was from that moment that I, we developed a leadership, uh, leadership committee, leadership. We called it the captains. We, we named four captains within the team. They had responsibilities. They were part of the decision-making. They, they were sent schedules. They, were, they sent feedback. And they were part of everything that we did. And from that moment onwards, I felt my life as a coach improved in terms of, do you know what? I, I, had to, I, I could do less, but empower and give responsibility. And I became a better coach for the advice that Tracy gave me because, and that I think is probably, probably more apparent in female sport, probably in terms of involving a female athlete in the process, involving them in the decision-making, I think it's a big thing in female sports. And, uh, and that was the best bit of advice that she gave me. And the second best bit of advice was, is when I was going to the Sheeblees for the first time, which is my first major tournament uh, with the squad, I said, I'm, I'm doing a training session. Uh, my, my style is, my style can be quite demanding. And she said, don't change. They want you for who you are. So if you, if you want to be demanding, be demanding. They don't want another softer version of you. And so, so that bit of advice was just be myself uh, and hopefully that, that, you'd, that, that they would like. And, and, and I've got to say that I hope they did. Yeah, look, like some success in it. It was, it was interesting that I, I can't remember if you or Gary during the interview, but one of you actually said that you were better at netball than Tracy as well. I'm pretty sure it was you. No, it but, wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> so it might have been Gary, but like it, the, the incredible amount of sport that has come out of your family, I suppose it gives you all those experiences that you can speak to one another and develop that as well. And yeah. listening to how you empowered some of those leaders within the team, did that help you understand? understand the team better while you're still developing this kind of transition from the men's game to the women's game? No, I, th I think, uh, look, my style probably is similar to, to Sir Alex in terms of the, the biggest thing I took from Sir Alex is that when, when I walked into Sir Alex Ferguson's office when I was 12, and it was me and my dad, I went in to sign uh, schoolboy forms, which, which was a big thing at the time. I left school at my lunch hour, just went, drove down to the cliff. And, and my dad walked into the room and he knew everything about my dad. He knew my dad was a cricketer. He knew my mum liked netball. He, he knew my grandma and granddad worked at uh, Berry Football Club on the car park and in the catering. And my dad walked out and he said, this man is a genius. This man is someone that I will trust with my life to give you the best possible start. And so, so I, think, I think what I took out of that is that you have to know more than just the player, the person as a... Uh, sorry, you have to know more than just the player. You have to know the person. You have to know what makes them tick. You have to know what inspires them. You have to know about their family. I think if you if you speak to a player and you you ask how their mother and father is, how their partner is, how their kids are, if you know the names of their kids and their partners, etc., if you know their interests, uh, and I suppose a good example of that is we we've just been come back from a, a tournament now, and we had five new players under the age of twenty one, and we we put three months of two or three months of hard work into finding out what made these players tick. And when they came onto camp, 
every single staff member knew everything about every one of these players from from their hobbies, from their parents, from their background, from the school that they went to. And it's the first thing that these these girls said to us at the end when we asked them for, for a debrief. They said, the way that you the way that you found out about our families told us that that you cared about us. And I think that's what Sir Alex taught me. You have to care for your players. You have to get them to to believe that you're caring for them. And and you know what? From the start, I, I made it my absolute uh, obsession to find out everything I needed to know about my players. And and when you see the celebrations of the goals and you see the the, the banter in and around the camp. You know that togetherness, that team spirit, that culture has been developed because they know that everybody cares for each other. And do you find like making sure that everyone behind the team, because obviously we see 11 players on the pitch and yourself on the sidelines with some people stood behind you. Yeah. Is it important to make sure that every one of your backroom staff as well is understanding of that and really drives forward with that kind of well, mentality that- as well? They're, they're the most important people. The, 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 the contact that, that, say, for instance, the contact that Dawn has with my players is probably four or five times more than me. So, so she has to have the same value. She has, to be, she has to be spreading the same types of challenges and opportunities and, and the wording and the language has to be the same. The masseur, the amount of times that the masseur, that as a player, I used to go around to the masseur, ma- massage room and, and sometimes laugh, sometimes joke, sometimes cry. And you spend your best, you spend your best time. You have your biggest influences in the camps or in your teams with people away from the manager. The manager has very, very little contact time compared to your assistants, your GK coach, who is constantly with the GKs, your fitness coaches, your massage, your medical. If if there was a problem in the camp and it, and it was. Uh, say a minor problem the players wouldn't come to me they would go to dawn they would go to my physio they would go to my doctor or to my assistant so ultimately you've got to get the right people on the bus and the right people on the bus are more uh, in, in, in my in my uh, sort of like experience have to be almost better in, than you in certain areas uh, to keep the challenge up and they always have to be have the same type, types of values as you and the, and, and the values that we that I wanted in my staff was one, I wanted them to be the best, the best in their field. I wanted to provide an elite environment for my players. I wanted them when they came to England to get better than they've ever had at any other point in their career. So the, the best food, which so we, we employ the chef, the best medical, so we, we got the best medical people, the best fitness coach. Uh, we've nearly got the best fitness coach. We're still working on that one, Don. <laughs> so, uh, but other than that, we, you have to get the best people around you and you have to trust them to do their job. And, uh, and, that, and that is what we've tried to do. I'll, I'll bring Dawn on 10 minutes early so that she can defend that comment as well. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so, because obviously going back to like the coaching philosophy, I know we talked about that before. Have you found that from when you were thinking about it as a player to now actually being a head coach, do you think that actually the backroom staff have come, become a big part of your coaching philosophy to help you develop it as well? Yeah, absolutely. They, they, you spend, you spend a lot of time with your uh, coaching staff. When, 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 part of my philosophy is, is, is I love, I love hard work. I love taking the players out of the comfort zone physically because I think it improves them mentally, and I think it makes us a better football team. And that, that's what we had at Manchester United and Everton. Uh, we had we had great fitness coaches that that got us to be fitter than probably other teams. And, and ultimately, I think I think if you if you've got to employ people that, that have the same type of philosophy, so you've got to get the right people on the bus. And, and, and what we've got is, is we've, 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 got, we've, we've got a situation with women's football that where it was two years ago to where it is now, our, our players have developed so much physically because of the work that, the, the work that they're doing at their clubs and the work that they're doing with the international team. And, and I, think, I think that is... That is paramount. The work that my assistants do in terms of the, the sessions that they put on, in terms of the, the delivery, my analysis people do fantastic work in terms of the the, uh, the reviews, the preparation for camps, in terms of uh, of what we actually produce for the players. So ultimately, I think I think what what you need as a head coach, you need great people around you, and it's the great people around you that make you an even better manager. And I think when people are going from being an assistant to to becoming a number one. 
the people that you have around you can actually define you as a coach, can actually make you be successful or can actually can make you fail. And I think that was the, that was the one thing that I spent a lot of time on when I came into uh, coaching is that when I first came in, uh, I had a, I had a young coach called Casey Stone and she, she was and is, and is going to be one of the best coaches, female coaches, I think in the world. I've, I've got to say that at the time she was young, but at the time she reminded me a little bit of when I was young, but she'd been coaching for 10, 15 years. So she came in, we, 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 we give her the trust to develop. Then after three months, she was at the point where I was probably, she wanted to be number one. She got frustrated probably with not making decisions, with not coaching every day on the grass. So then she got the job at Manchester United. Then we spent the next probably six to eight months, we didn't have an assistant manager, a female assistant manager, which I think is really important. Uh, so we spent six to eight months then looking for the right person. And we found that person. Uh, she was an English coach working in Canada, Beverly Priestman. We brought her over. And, and she's been an unbelievable asset for me alongside my goalkeeping coach, Mark Mason. And uh, we have a part-time coach called Garant Tuz, who's brilliant at the individual development plans and the technical work of the players. And, and, and that is just the technical side. But you add in there two fitness coaches, uh, two, an, two analysis, uh, a, a psych, uh, a, a two player liaison officers. You've got commercial people. You've got media people. So all of a sudden, we went from... 12 people, I think. We took 12 staff to 14 staff on my first trip. We've now got 32 staff traveling with us, uh, which is an incredible incredible amount of staff. Too, too, too many. I've got to say too many, but it's, it's the way that the game's grown that we've had to uh, bring staff in to facilitate the growth of the game and, 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 the, and the improvements that we've made. Do you find you're having to manage staff now just as much as the players? Oh. They're the worst. <laughs> they're, 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 they are. They're, they're the ones that need the managing the most. And and you know what? We 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 are because when you when you've got a staff as good as probably what we've got, I think I think when you go that everybody wants a piece of the action. Everybody wants to coach the players. Everybody wants to have an impact on a player, a unit, or a group of players. So the managing of that and allowing them to one, allowing them to work, allowing them to have the trust, and then allowing them to have job satisfaction, which I think is massively important, uh, is, is, is really, it's really a, it's a work of art to schedule that in, particularly when you've only got five sessions on a camp and 10 days and two games, to, to, to actually work that everybody comes out the camp. Sometimes it's impossible to give people the, the time and the place to actually have major impacts uh, with, with their time. And, and that for me is, is something that I spend a lot of time managing, making sure that, because ultimately the first contact the players have is with my staff and they've got to have the energy, the enthusiasm uh, and the qualities to, to be that great first person that, that impacts the players. Yeah. And I think going on comments that you said about Casey, I think you're exactly right. She actually came to a lot of the junior camps when I was working there with Mo Marley and Casey yeah. was coming and doing similar to what you were doing in the academy. So yeah. yeah, it's refreshing to say that as well. And the, I suppose when you talk about staff and how they can help support you as well as managing them, really, I suppose, do you have to have those kind of like leadership groups within your staff as well that you have with the place to set those expectations for a camp? It's like this camp, we've got two or three games. We yeah. ain't going to have time to do this, this and this. But this camp, there's one game we have time to do that. So do you have to think long term strategically to help everyone get that? job satisfaction well i think i think we uh we have an mdt multidisciplinary team that's the model that we work to at the at the fa which consists of a head of every department uh and and, and what we do is is that I, I like to set an objective for a camp and and and, and i give you an example and i think i think it's probably quite a good example because it because it involves the fitness coach we went to qatar and uh it was a 12-day training camp uh, in the Middle East, uh, and and the theme, the theme of the camp was togetherness. The biggest thing we wanted to get out of the camp was uh, togetherness. It was it was a month before we went to a mini tournament. We wanted to work on the togetherness, the the feeling, the the, the cohesion within the team. Uh, and and once you have a theme, once you have an objective, then you then you work down how do we get that. And and unfortunately for the fitness coach, it meant that he. He had to sacrifice because what, what we said was we wanted to do things on the pitch, technically, tactically, 
uh, games wise we wanted to do things off the pitch like team team things uh, psych things we wanted to take them out into the desert and do an experience so they could create memories which meant that there was becoming little time for snc work so what we did we put everything on the table uh, everything that everybody wanted to do and then we we said well, well we, re we related everything back to actually what was the object of the camp the, the, the object of the camp was togetherness so ultimately we we put the the key things in at the top and everything else below that became secondary and unfortunately for for the snc coach at the time uh, coaches at the time uh it meant that they got less work with the team in terms of doing the the, the, the strength and conditioning programs that, that they'd set out in terms of the build up to the world cup which which obviously disappointed them because the physic the physical side was a big thing that we was going for but in this particular camp we were going for togetherness i i i still think that the spirit togetherness and the culture of the team can override any any anything else that goes with it and that's technically tactically and physically so so i think that was one of the instances where as a multidisciplinary team we we put everything on the table everyone that every department put something in that they wanted to impact there was there was media there was site there was tech there was tact then there was physical and then there was social and because it was a togetherness camp we realized that we that if we'd have done 10 things, we'd achieve nothing. We focused on two things, the pitch and doing football and the social togetherness side off the pitch. And I've got to say, by the end of the camp, the fitness coach was absolutely, he was fantastic the way that he accepted his role. He actually did get an SNC session in one day because it was so hot. So, so, so we, we impacted a little bit there by giving him a little bit of impact and a little bit of job satisfaction. But ultimately, if you're if your themes and objectives for a certain thing are one thing, then you've got to provide the best platform to the players to do that. And I, all, I would always say, and I go back to the Moyes-Ferguson uh, analogy, that you're better off be, being world-class at one or two things than trying to do 10 different things and achieving nothing. Yes, but I suppose it's, a, it's an interesting one, really, because, like, each staff member as part of the multidisciplinary team is very focused upon their their individual like objectives that they want to achieve and it's yeah. taken your job as a head coach is taking them all into account really. So like that that camp sounds like you achieved the objectives and you were able to get that. Is there any time where you feel as though you you've had to just take a step back and really review actually was that the right thing to do? Or do you do that with every camp for not just the backroom staff, but also for the players as well, because ultimately the players are the most important ones to help you get the results on the pitch. Well, the the, the, the players, the players should be at the central of every decision that we make. I think, I think mean, that's that's the first and foremost, and that's why that's why when we have the, the the MDT meetings leading up to camp, and we have one every day on camp as well, is that ultimately, if it's the best thing for a player that that they that they don't train or they don't have an SNC session, then that's the best thing. And that's what we should do because ultimately the ego, the ego of the coach, the ego of, of the personality should go out the window when, when ultimately the players should always be central. Uh, have, have we made mistakes along the way? Yes. But I think, I think my philosophy, my philosophy is that sometimes you've got to take risks. You've got to take risks in life to win. And, and for instance, when we came back from the world cup, uh, we wanted to change the mentality of the team again. We we think we thought there was, or there definitely is another a jump up in level. Uh, we 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 took them, uh, we took them for a couple of seven thirty little gym sessions. We wanted to sort of like get that mentality that you know at any point in the day you can go into a gym or you can go a, a, onto a pitch and practice because I, I still think that we've still got to raise the level of elite performance and elite behaviour. So, so we took them to a gym twice on camp uh, because camp time is very precious. We took them in at seven in the morning. We got them up. We took them to the gym. Now, ultimately, looking back, coming off the back of the World Cup, I'd say it was, wasn't the, probably the smartest idea that I had. But, but I, what I wanted to do, I wanted, I wanted to affect a mentality. I wanted to make sure that they knew that we weren't standing still. Would I do it again? Probably not. I wouldn't. And then along the way, we've, we've took risks and we've lost games because we've took risks. We've, we've, we've got into camps and we've, we've said, right, we're, we're going to go a certain way on this camp to see how the players react. And, and sometimes they've reacted good, sometimes they've reacted bad. 
uh, and then we've learned and then gone forward. So I, I do like to take risks in terms of not risks in terms of damaging the players, but risks in terms of my decision making. If there is if there is a staff member that comes up to me and says this is what we need to do, and then provides evidence that it will make us fitter, faster, stronger, and help us become world champions, then I'm willing to take whether it's a risk, whether it's a gamble, or whether to be open minded to do it. Uh, I'm that type of coach. Because I know within like a couple of your previous in- interviews and that reason, you've been talking about like the innovative strategies you've been trying to do. And is that part of that mindset where you want to try and new things and challenge it? And then when you get to those like qualifiers, to those tournaments, you're in a good place ready to implement the things that you know are right and some things that aren't right in that process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we came out of the World Cup and realised that for two years, we, we haven't got a major tournament in England for two years. Where, you know, it was the Euro 2021, now it's Euro 2022. So ultimately, our thought process changed totally from what it was leading up to the World Cup, where we wanted real stability, uh, we wanted consistency in our work, and we wanted to get the players to a certain level to go into a World Cup. Now, now, from, from the World Cup, we, we, we knew we had a squad that was coming probably to the end of its life uh, cycle, but probably had another probably 12, maybe 14 months left in it. So we said that we were going to use probably the first 12 months uh, to experiment, to make changes, to, to, to try and, you know, to make the next step, take a few risks and, you know, results 12 months ago, what we said, results might not go our way, but we've actually got to keep being brave in our decision making because bravery is one of our, was one of our values. You know, if, if the, if the head coach and the staff aren't brave, how can we ask the players to be brave on the pitch when they're going out at Wembley? So we, we, we have took some risks and we have suffered because, because the results haven't gone our way. We've, but along the way, I think we'll be better for it once we come to a major tournament. And now we're thinking about, 2022 there will be some con- consistency and stability come back but what we've learned over the last 12 months i think will give us the evidence to then have a real plan going forward and how we're going to attack uh, the next three-year cycle of olympics then a euros then a world cup it's, it's an unbelievable three-year cycle for us and the last 12 months has us been building sort of like a a, a strategy a philosophy and trying out things to know where we're at now to attack the next three years. Because on the back of that as well, I suppose like this, this obviously isn't a planned period of time within the cycle of like your lionesses. How have you kind of like adapted to this phase of lockdown kind of thing and remote coaching? It's been difficult. I've got to say, I think every coach is finding it really difficult. There was that period when the virus obviously first uh, came out where where the players got really stuck into their fitness and, and, you, and thought about it as a time to really make you review, you reset, and then you, and you charge forward. And, and we're at the point now where I think the players and the staff, everyone's at the point now where probably a little bit physically, physically a little bit tired. There's no end date, what we're training for. Uh, I think there always needs to be an end point what you can aim for. So I think, I think from a from a coach's point of view, I think I've I've co- I've come away a little bit, took a step back. We we are now beginning to touch base with the players a little bit from a technical point of view in terms of because we think there's probably going to be an, another month, five weeks before anything happens, where we're just resetting the goals a little bit. Now we've had a period of of reflection, uh, and now it's the time to reset the goals in terms of new IDP plans. New, new objectives going forward. And I think, I think that the conversations that we've had with the players, that breathing space from management to a player, I think has actually been really good from an international point of view. They needed that probably. And now it's a case of where they, they, they seem really hungry now to focus on another three-year cycle. So we've, we're now beginning to set plans for the next three years. I was going to say, cause I suppose it's that you talk about the squad coming to, like, there'll be some players that now next year you probably go that would be the last tournament actually now it's gone a year on it's like did they come into question or is it still the same objective with the same group of players that are attacking that now three-year cycle well you know what you know i think if you if you look at the the major the the, the winners of the major tournaments uh, and usa are a prime example their their average age i think that dawn will back me up on this i think i think they've got most players at 28 29 30 and above you look at Carly Lloyd, I think it's 30, 36. I mean, experience, no. experience wins you major tournaments. 
so, so I think it would be absolutely stupid of, of me as a head coach to, to say, one, one we have got an, a, an unbelievable set of young players coming through, probably the most exciting set of young players that I've seen for a long time. But also we've got a, we've got a, a bunch of players at 30 to 34, say Jill Scott at 34, Karen Bardsley at similar age, who have probably still got miles left in the tank. Jill Scott went to a World Cup and played in every single game, was probably one of our best players and, and never dropped physically in any single game. So uh, the way that she looks after herself means that there's no way in the world that you could go up to a player like that and say, you're, you're not part of the future going forward. Because one, one she's still fit enough and good enough. And, and two, I think she's got a massive role to play with these young players that we're coming through. And I was at a football club where, where we had specific plans for for training bespoke programs for gigs played until he was 42. My brother played until he was 37. Skulls played into, until he was 38. I played until I was 36, 37. Why? Because we had bespoke program, programs that got us through the last three or four years of our career playing at, at the top level, but just managing our programs better than what we did probably at 24, 25. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to transition, but also still believe that these players are good enough. And I suppose that brings us on to kind of like the future. You talked about having that 10 to 20 year kind of career and actually doing things to help you prolong it as well. Like where do you kind of see the future of the women's game and where the national team can help support the domestic league as well to try and get the better outcome, obviously, for the national team? Yeah, well, I think I think, I think think we can all see where the women's game is going. I think that the last the last four to five years, the, the, the growth on and off the pitch has been incredible. That since, since probably the last two years, the, 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 the visibility of our players has meant that, that there are now unbelievable opportunities. You are get, you're now getting, beginning to see the effects of full-time training, physically and, and technically and tactically. The crowds are getting bigger. But ultimately, I think from international football uh, to, to club football, there, there is still a gap. There is still a gap between, between physically what, what we're doing, what, the, what say they're doing at, at club level to what they're doing at international level, at the top level. So I think, what we're do, I think what we're trying to do now is we're trying to bring that gap closer in terms of the intensity of our work. I keep, I keep saying it, elite, elite performance behaviours, I think, are the ones that I've noticed over the last two years is one that I've concentrated more on in the last two years the the work they do away from their coach if, if you're only doing what your coach is saying then that's not enough and the extra 22 hours now I think are going to be absolutely crucial to a lot of and I'm talking to our England girls if they want to become world class if they want to win world cups and Olympic gold medals that is what they have to keep working hard on and and the extras that you have to put in and and that is living your life right eating right physically training right, recovering right. The extra 22 hours are going to be the big difference. And I think because we are now seeing more financial uh, input into the women's game, which means that the quality of the staff now and the, and the quality of the coaching, the quality of the facilities on offer to the girls means that they can only improve if they dedicate themselves to it. And I think what we will see over the next 10 to 20 years time, and we saw it in the World Cup, the level of performance at the World Cup People just didn't tune in. 11.7 million tuned in to watch England versus USA. Not because they had to. They tuned in because they saw great quality, brilliant athletes, uh, technical, technically really, really good players, brilliant goals, excitement. They saw things that actually thought, wow, that was really good. And I saw that in most games in the World Cup. Brilliant physically, brilliant tactically, technically some great goals, brilliant goalkeeping. And I think over the next 10 years, that will only get better with the investment that people are making and the quality of the coaches now that are now coming to the women's game, wanting to work with the best players. But the elite performance behaviour as an individual player still needs to get better and, and will keep improving. Um, and would that help if you had a better fitness coach as well? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, th I think that's something that, that's an area I'm looking at, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don, do you want to defend yourself at all? <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you was on, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just making some notes, looking for a new employer. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. I suppose a lot of the stuff that you've been mentioning, Phil, about like the development, Dawn's obviously going to be a big part of, and 
again, we'll come on to this during Dawn's Q and A because she's had an incredible career throughout the women's game so far. But how, like, how do you think we'll see the women's game evolve over the next ten to twenty years? So obviously, you talked about how players and the domestic and national team can help one another. How do you see it evolving further? Is that to me, Steve? Yeah, sorry, that was to you, Phil. Yeah, sorry about that. No, well, I think I think what you what what we've seen is is that the the growth of the game means now that you know, and, and I don't think we should ever compare it to the men's game. I think that's a big mistake. I think we have to be we have to be on our own. We have to be bespoke. Uh, we will get there eventually, but I think at this moment in time, there are still fundamental things that we still need to get right from from the bottom right to the very top. Uh, and I think that that alignment from top to bottom in terms of the direction in which we're going will mean that we get better players, better clubs, better performances, bigger crowd, better stadiums to play in, better facilities for our girls. Because ultimately, you know, if you if you think if you think on top of the water, or oh, England played in front of eighty thousand at, we- at Wembley, everything's great. But beneath that, there are still issues within women's football, that the, the pitches need to be better, the facilities need to get greater, the, the access to facilities need to be better. We play games in December, January. Most of them get cancelled because there's no under soil heating uh, and, and the pitches aren't up to the level that, that, that you should expect for the elite league in, in England. So I think on the face of it, women's football is, is in a great place. But underneath, I still think there are fundamental things that we still need investment to keep making things better. And that's the better conditions for our coaches to work, better conditions for our coaches to develop and better opportunities. And, and if somebody asks me, like, what's the difference between a male and a female coach, a, 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 a technical coach? And I would say that the biggest thing is, is that the belief, I see, I see, I see women uh, coach, female coaches coach brilliantly but probably don't have the belief yet because of the lack of opportunity in the past to go the, to put themselves out there. And what I say to the, the, the female coaches I speak to is put yourself out there. You're good enough. And we need to keep providing those opportunities for female coaches. And I hope that the next coach that follows me, I hope that it's female. I know we want it to be the best person, but I think, I think I'd, I'd love part, part of the, part of the, the, the thing that I said on my job interview was, is that I, I want to play a part. I want to help develop the next female England manager. And, and I think what we've seen over the last two years is, is Casey, Bev Priestman, we've seen Mel Ray, we've seen Rianne Skinner, all work within the national team. And they've gained confidence and belief from that for them to put themselves out there. And, the, and three out of the four coaches... Sorry, the, the, two, the two coaches in the final of the World Cup were both female. It shows that female coaching... Is, is at a really high level. Now I think female coaches are getting better opportunities. That's, that's brilliant, Philip. Thank you. And Dawn, have you got any questions you want to ask Phil before we, we wrap up? <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. I think we're speaking <laughs> about <Sorry enough. laughs> I thought that might be the answer. I thought you might have given a bit of grief after some of the comments you've made. But <laughs> no, no, I'm good. <laughs> no, Phil, Phil, that's been brilliant. Thank you very much. And I suppose like, the last... The last thing I'll, I'll ask you just to wrap it up really is for any aspiring coaches or backroom staff or even people that are currently working in the game really, what what bit of advice would you give them to try and help give themselves better opportunities to succeed like you have? Well, I think, I think uh, I'll always go back to... Uh... What's right, folks? And there was there was one coaching course that we had to go on. We do, we just we just won the FA Cup final. And we had to go on a two 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 week residential coaching course. Me, Ryan Giggs, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, and my brother Gary. And we went in to see Sir Alex Ferguson. And basically, we said, "Look, could you could you get us out of this course and just get us a pass? And and because we're a bit tired, we want to go on holiday." And he literally picked up a cricket bat and nearly hit us over the head and said, there's no shortcuts in life. You've got to get out there. You've got to, if you want to be the best coaches, you've got to put the work in. You've got to, you've got to do the, the stuff that takes you to become one of the best coaches. And, and he always related it back to what we put in to be the best players. And to be the best players, we sacrificed an awful lot. We worked hard three, four times a day we used to train. And he demanded that of us when we were starting our coaching journey and there was no shortcuts. And, and I think the best coaches that I see nowadays are the ones that 
actually really put the work in. That, that I know he's going to say, never switch the phone off. Are always are always wanting to learn, always going to courses, always wanting to study other things. And uh, I think that's the advice that I would say to any any coach is that grab a, grab any opportunity that comes your way, listen and learn to any kind of experience or session or webinar that you can, and. The most important thing is make sure you have belief in yourself. And when you go out in front of those players, you've almost got to be a little bit of an actor and go out there and get your chest out and just deliver, deliver to your players with your belief and confidence and, and, and back yourself to, to do that and grab any opportunity that comes your way. And, and ultimately, the last thing he used to say to us was make sure you bloody enjoy it. And that's what I've done over the last two years. I've enjoyed every single moment, the, the good, the bad, the defeats, the draws, uh, you've got to enjoy it along the way because I think that's when you do your best work. 